to team or not to team? That is the question. I've helped many people coach themselves into a great team. I've helped many leaders lead a team. And I've also unfortunately been in a position to be able to help facilitate people breaking up, uh, breaking up their team. Uh, why? Because teams aren't for everybody. However, if you can leverage the understanding of a collective of people within one organization that's system and process driven, you'll find that any team on the street is going to be able to outperform any individual pound for pound. It's not just about personalities and I really like this person, so I'm going to join their team or I'm going to hire them and they're going to be part of my team. You have to really, really dial it into what are the benefits and the liabilities associated with this relationship at this death. You're going to find that not everybody is good at everything and some people might claim to be really good at some things but they really aren't and the time to figure that out is before you start a team it can be incredibly disruptive for you to get three four five months down the road and then finally come to the realization that the person that you thought was going to help you with social media the person that you thought was going to help you with prospecting the person that you thought was going to help you with transaction management or all the other disciplines that you need to be great at well, that person might not be carrying your weight. And on the flip side of that, they might be 100% convicted that they are giving 110%. If your brokerage allows teams, then the odds are really good. They already have some sort of documentation for team agreement. And unfortunately, those agreements are going to be mostly centered around commission split. Uh, and who gets GSI and where does the money come from? And how does that get divided once the pie gets baked and it's sitting on the table? My concern isn't that. My concern is level of effort and intentionality and who is going to be doing what. I would prefer that you put some sort of an agreement in place in addition to whatever's compliant with your brokerage to say, hey, um, there's a level of difficulty associated with procuring a lead. And we assign that a number, right? A percentage. There's a percentage of difficulty associated with writing the purchase agreement, we're showing a property. I would take five or six key elements in your transaction life cycle and that workflow life cycle and identify how important is that to the overall process. So one of the things that I've never been really in agreement with is to pay out 35% in commission referral. Um, is a lead really that valuable? Well, you know, it might be if you're not really good at prospecting or you're not nurturing your past repeat and referral clients, then, you know, you might find yourself in a position where you have to pay 35% for a lead. But in a team environment, be careful. So does your team member think that if they bring a lead to the table, they're going to get an automatically 35% right off the top. Well, maybe they are and maybe they aren't, but whatever agreement you make, I want you to put a little bit of thought into that. It needs to be in writing and everybody within your team structure has to understand that, hey, just because, you know, I got a list of people and some of them might buy, these are my clients, these are your clients, these are team clients. You're going to have to figure out how those leads get sorted. You're going to have to figure out what's the level of difficulty associated with each task. You're going to have to figure out who in the team is really good and skilled at doing specific things in the team and for the team. Um, and what is the value of that? Are the other, do the other team members see the value in it? If not, you're going to have a really difficult time. And eventually there's going to be an argument over the division of commission as it relates to the divisional labor. Okay, lastly, and probably most importantly, I do not recommend that you have a partner. Unless that partner is your spouse, there's a lot of husband and wife teams that do really well out there in real estate, and I think that's just fine. It works great. But if you get yourself into a situation where you have a partnership with somebody else um, in real estate, you're going to find that you get the best and the worst of both worlds, but the likelihood is the worst of both worlds. So now um, you've taken the authority that you have over your business and you've totally abdicated it. Now your income is going to be um, dependent on somebody else's opinion and how that person works and their style. What I'd rather see you do is create system and process and replicatability and then expand to the point at which, okay, you need you need a transaction coordinator, right? Now that transaction coordinator may, may or may not be able to take on some additional responsibilities around marketing.
But if not, you're going to have to maybe hire a marketing uh, coordinator who can help you. That person will put together your listing presentations. That person's going to help you do a variety of other things. They're going to free you up. You expand your business. Guess what happens next? You need to add, uh, add a buyer's agent, right? You're taking a lot of listings. You're generating a lot of the leads off your listings. You need to do something responsible with these leads. And you don't have time to execute them on your, uh, entirely by yourself. Maybe you had a second buyer's agent. Maybe you bring in a listing agent um, that lists different types of properties than maybe are slightly outside of your expertise. Maybe it's luxury. Maybe it's new construction. Maybe it's something else. I don't want you to give up control over your money. I don't want you to give up control over your team. I think teams are great, and I want you to be the quarterback. Please hit that subscribe button, and don't forget, visit our website and schedule your free 30-minute evaluation.